Welcome to Baker's Green A. Mark, your host, and this is going to be the Anyone Can Farm Experience live chat. Tuesday night edition, we've got a subject that we want to talk about tonight. It's going to be our main focus of the night. Hopefully, if I can stay focused. Building the farm slash homestead without the bank. Without the bank. I got nothing against banks. Don't get me wrong. That's not the point. The point is uh, you can build your homestead, and I believe that you should build your homestead without the bank. You may need the bank to buy your property. That's pretty common these days. Has been for a long time. But as far as the, the infrastructure on the homestead, I'm not sure that that's totally necessary. So, uh, all right, today's show is going to be brought to you by the Anyone Can Farm Experience. That is our new uh, channel. And if you've noticed, our new channel is, is really growing in leaps and bounds. I guess we've got uh, over 8,000 subscribers now, and that's all happened very quickly. I've been tracking some of that. And uh, it goes back about three weeks when it really started to turn on. Um, very interesting that that coincided with the uh, the midwinter meetup. Um, we had a really interesting group of people that came to that, and maybe that had something to do with it. I really don't know. It's uh, algorithm world. Things might look a little different to you today. They do to me because Joe's put up new lights. My little area here <clears throat> is changing is changing the coat rack was taken down while we were gone and joe's got big plans for putting a counter in here because mrs b is going to start doing some videoing of her own some uh you know recipe things and cheese making and soap making and all that stuff going to do it online and uh we think it'll be good content. We think it'll be people that things that people want. Now, let me divert just a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about something. You know, I I'm supposed to stay on task. I'm supposed to stay on the subject, but I can't help but diverting a little bit because I had a very interesting weekend. Um, we weren't on Thursday night. You guys may have noticed, and that's because Jill and I went to a a conference. Uh, I didn't really know what it was. We we have a friend that had been involved in it before, and she spoke highly of it. Um, it's called the Landmark Forum, and I kind of assumed it had something to do with this, you know, taking your business to the next level and and all those things. Turns out it was more of a personal development uh, program, and uh, you know, of the three days. Days that I was there, I was there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And it's one of these, you get there nine o'clock in the morning. They don't let you go until 10 o'clock at night, three days. And then they started up again tonight, Tuesday night. They're going it right now. <coughs> and they're going to go till 10 o'clock tonight for the final thing. But we couldn't do it. Um, it would have required another night stay in Chicago. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I'm not... <clears throat> I'm not a connoisseur of cities, not, not at all. Uh, to me, they just seem like everybody's too bunched up and there's really much to do. And, you know, it's not my thing. And that's where this was. It was in Chicago. So we went down there on Thursday night. It was about a six hour ride Thursday afternoon, got a hotel, had to park in a building in a parking garage. That was really wild for me. I realized how sheltered I am living on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but what I want to point out in a short period of time here before, you know, I get myself in too much trouble is what I noticed about the people, right? I was a room with 120 people and most of them were from that area they have these meetings in those big areas so they can draw a lot of people uh there we were the only farmers there 
you're there for three days. So you start to know people and find out what they do. And um, people take to the microphone, you know, and they, they tell their story and then they are trying to overcome uh, what it is that's bothering them, keeping them from attaining the next level of what Whatever it is, doesn't have to be business necessarily. And I probably would not have gone to something like that on my own. I probably wouldn't have. I would have looked for something that was more uh, in tune with what I want to do. But I did. I had to say to people, though, I had to say that, well, uh, you know, we've. We've chosen a lifestyle that's more intentional. Um, the way it is in the city is things are coming at you all the time. You just get in place and then it starts coming at you and you have to deal with it. And a lot of the people felt as though they were on a treadmill. And uh, I really felt sorry for them. Um, the, the couple of people that I did get into a little bit deeper conversation, I told them what I did for a living, why I did it. And for those of you don't, that don't know, my wife and I were involved in big organizations before we did this. She worked at a hospital, you know, she would, it was a big hospital and I worked for the U.S. military. So we were in big organizations that you're really just a number and you're just navigating the organization. And then every now and then they ask you to do something that is uh, pertinent to whatever that organization does. Mine was the Air Force, so they flew airplanes, and Jill's was occupational therapy, so they fixed people's hands and wrists and things like that, and other things too. I'm not. It truly was a treadmill. You were there at the right time, and then you left when it was over, and it was over. Where this is not that. And what I realized the difference is between that lifestyle and this lifestyle is uh, we attain goalposts. We hit goalposts. And I was trying to explain it to this, this young woman who I thought she was a trial lawyer because she was dressed to, to the nines, really good looking, and had perfect speech and you know very well educated. But had some problems, some personal problems. But anyway, I thought she was probably a trial lawyer, lawyer when I got to talking to her because she was so quick on her feet. But she was way more interested in our way of life than the way of life that she was living in in Chicago. And uh, I was really impressed with her. And I got to say to her, and you ever say something that comes out of your mouth and say, you know what? That should be on a cereal box or something, you know, somebody should write that down someplace. They ought to make a statue with that on it. And I said, in our way of life, in the farming way of life, the homesteading way of life, we have goalposts that we passed. So we set goals for ourselves and then we attain those and then we go on to the next thing. And as we attain those things, we have, uh, built behind us an infrastructure, a system, uh, and, and a way to operate, right? And that, that actually does uh, tie in with the subject of tonight is building the homestead without the bank because the bank only provides you one thing. They don't provide you with advice. Usually they provide you with a guideline. And if you do it within these guidelines, then we'll give you the money. And if you were to tell them, well, I kind of want to put together a homestead and I'm not really sure how it'll be, but I want to have sunsets and sunrises there. And I want the birds to sing and just every day to be fun, you know, and the kids can run around and, and you know, that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for, okay, you're going to build this. Okay. What's the building cost? What will our return on an investment in your homestead be? OK. But anyway, talking with this person, and I had several conversations like this, but this one was uh, um, more intense. I said, you know, there's things that happen in my life that 
I encounter on an ongoing basis. And I said, here's an example. And it just so happens Joe put out a video of this. Joe's going wild with the shorts, if you haven't noticed. Hey, look at that. Joe Baker is on here, right? And I'm, I'm plugging you here, brother. He's uh, He put out a video of um, Bell. Bell is the calf that was born, I guess it's two weeks ago. And when I found her, she was nearly dead, right? Because uh, it was a real cold day. I was pushing snow. And Cece, her mother, had had her out in the snow and, you know, wasn't really you know, there's not much she could do. The wind was blowing really hard and it was just a rough day. And uh, the calf was on its way <clears throat> to uh, the other side. And we got it, brought it in. And I was able to, uh, the shop was warmed up. I was able to lay there with the calf, um, you know, body to body and and put my, bo my body heat into her lack of body heat. Her ears were frozen. And then... Jill and the kids came down and we were discussing, <clears throat> you know, what are we going to do? What, what should we do? And uh, Jill's like, well, I'll go milk the cow. And so she milked Cece, brought her in, put her in the stanchion. You know, Cece hasn't been milked in a while because she was dried up for a while. And uh, came down with a bottle of milk. We got that in the calf, uh, a little bit of it. And, uh, you know, after a while, the calf's head was up. And the eyes were there. They weren't rolled back. And, you know, it's it's not a day I'm going to forget anytime soon. i just just not going to forget it. And then uh, the calf was sitting up by herself. And then she, she was standing up. This was the next day. And she never did bond with her mother. She looked right at us and thought, hmm, you must be my mother. You know, you're the special people in my life. And so that's the way it's been. And... <clears throat> Then we had the midwinter event, and the kids were in the porta hut with her. I mean, she just loves everybody. And now she's going to be a big animal. She's going to be a Holstein Guernsey cross. She'll be big, and she'll be a part of our family. She is a part of our family now. So we'll keep her for 12 months. We'll breed her with Endeavor. And then we will, uh, you know, nine months after that, we'll get a calf from her and we'll start milking her. She'll be providing us with milk, which is what I have here right now. And, uh, you know, it's a milestone. And we are so fortunate to be able to look in the past at our life and see things like that and be reminded of those things when we get a drink of milk or we go out the door and we hear her, you know, making noise wanting something to eat you know it's very very fortunate and what i noticed of the people in the city you know uh you go there and you say oh, i gotta get out of here you know it's just dudes wearing pink earmuffs you know with little ears on them you know and high heels and stuff and it was kind of sickening a lot of what i saw i didn't see I didn't see a lot of return on investment. You know, that city is very expensive to keep it running. You know, there's a lot of heat that has to be going into it. Uh, the, the pipes, you know, with the steam in them, all the electricity, all the lighting, uh, the police, the sanitation, all that stuff to keep it going. And all you really see is hoodies and backpacks. You know, you do not see the businessman class going from place to place. I didn't. I did not see that. And I was looking for it because I wore a suit jacket in to this uh, landmark thing. And I was the only one in there with a jacket on. So anyway, it was an interesting observation. And I think it does tie in with this building a farm or homestead without the bank conversation that I want to have tonight. Because the homestead... You've heard me say this before, and I stand by it. It is really not exactly the place, all right? Like, if you think about our place here, you'd say, well, that's the Baker's Homestead, right? Yeah, 
But what if the Bakers didn't live here? Would it still be the Bakers homestead? Like if we just, like I've been threatening to do forever, is to sell this place and get me a shrimping boat and go down to the Gulf Coast, down with Andy. I've been threatening to do that. Would it still be, would this still be a homestead? No, it would most likely get bought up by uh, the big farms and the house would, they'd probably put migratory workers in here and, uh, you know, tear the barns down because they wouldn't need them. They wouldn't use them for anything. So it wouldn't be a homestead at all. That would go with us because even if we had a shrimp boat, there would be things that we would do on that shrimp boat that would be, they would be unique to the Baker homestead experience. All right. So our homestead, uh, Stumpos, the clerics, who else is on here? The Sutton Homestead. You know, it goes on and on. Wait a minute. There it is. Uh, I didn't really welcome anybody because I just launched right into it. Who do we got with us? We got Dion Stumpo. We got the Jay-Z. The Zilka Homestead. Zilka, what do they call it? Zilka. Hmm. Hmm, I could think of a good one, but I know you have one. I've seen it. I know you have a handle for your homestead. Clerics, Emily Sheffield. I think that's really Emily Rosa. Sean Wise, Ben Carlson's with us. Belva Rockwell's with us. What did I see that Belva Rockwell did recently? Oh, a picture of a feline on your prop is that a trail cam because that i think that looked like uh, a cheetah it had the dark spots under the eyes that sure looked like a cheetah to me that didn't look like a like a mountain lion Faylene baker with northwoods natural solutions that's my daughter-in-law right there mystic metal good evening y'all i wonder if that's the gal that was running the uh uh the landmark forum thing because she said you all all the time y'all she said y'all a lot and she said frickin a lot shaw lance is with us right on abundant living the health and wellness coach that's jill my little wife joe's with us i was with joe all day today we worked all day all right i know i'm gonna get to it okay so let's but i gotta welcome everybody joe Drowning in sap over here. All right. If you want your saw blades, buddy, you better get that title. That's all I can say. You look like you get a little break, Brian. Okay. David Duncan's with us. Sean, Keith is with us. <laughs> Ronan's with us. That's my little grandson. Crunchy Mama is with us. I'm going to be seeing Crunchy Mama Farms uh, next week. Because my son, that, oh, Bobcat, that sure looked, that sure looked like a cheetah to me. Looked too big. The Zilka Farm. Gee, I would think you could come up. Yeah, you could do a lot with that, with that. Zilka Farm. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah, next week, Monday, we're launching out again. Uh, my son Keith is going to be finish up his basic training, and we're going to go down for his graduation. So on our way back, we're going to stop and see the Crunchy Mamas and check out their operation. They're going to be having a class while we stop by, so I don't know how that will go, but it's, it's a cool environment, so I think we'll probably have fun. I think I think we will. I if it If it becomes, you know... A little too, you know. I'll be checking with Sean. If it's if it's not doable, then we will just uh, let it go, you know. But Sean was like, "Yeah, yeah, the class would love to see you." So maybe we, I would like to do that. I think that'd be a lot of fun. But I don't want to impose right? until I get my school bus, and then I'll be imposing like crazy. All right. So my my philosophy on building the homestead is going to be basically what we did here and there's reasons why we didn't involve the bank in our homestead and that was because 
Jill does not like to do that. There were times in my weaker moments when I said, you know what? We need to just borrow some money and get this built. And looking back on that, and because Jill didn't want to do it, she didn't really say, no, I don't want to do it. It wasn't like a, a confrontation. She was just, mm. and whenever that happens, I usually know that eh, she's probably right, you know, because if, if it was a good idea, she'd probably, yeah, okay, we better do this. There was one time when we were going to do it. There was one time and she, she was on board. And I'll share that with you. It's actually a great example of why you don't want to do this. <clears throat> okay. The homestead, is it a place or is it a state of mind? That's the question. I would say it's more state of mind than it is a place. I would say that. And I am saying that because if you just had a you know, an expense account of millions of dollars and you could do whatever you want, would you get that system in place? I, I Maybe you could, you could duplicate a homestead like this someplace else. Maybe you could. And then you would have that that ambiance that's, that's in, that has developed there. Like I've been to many of these people's homestead and they all have a different flavor and you can and think back on it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's not necessarily always good. You know, there's, there's some rough spots here, there and everywhere, uh, but they all have their own flavor. And some of them, you see it when they started and then you see it a year later and it looks like a different place totally different place um, because they start to see vision. It comes into focus and then they make a little bit of a change here and a little bit of a change here. I think the difference would be, all right, let's say uh, that you're going to make a carving of something. You get a piece of wood and you got a knife and you're, stuck in prison so you say well i might as well carve something so you go to carving on this thing and it starts to look like a fish so you just keep going but well then it starts to look like a i don't know a rock and roll singer and so you keep going and it's that well before you know it elvis presley you've got him you know and it's really nice all the other inmates are saying wow that looks really cool that is the king right there and then it winds up going down to the machine shop and somebody blueprints it and then they start turning them out. They start turning them out. All right. The difference between you sitting there and carving a little bit of a time, a little bit at a time and your creativity blossoming, that is way different than blueprinting what you've made and then putting it into a CNC machine and then boom, it just starts dropping them out the other side. Way different, way different. And I am I'm trying to communicate here that I think that building the homestead really needs to happen over a lifetime. It really does. It, you don't want to like uh, just well, let's borrow a million dollars and build this. And then you step back and you say, well, that's done. It's built. Now we got to pay it back. Okay. I hope those chickens lay. Did you buy tractor supply food? I hope not. All right. So, see, and I think a lot of the, the magic of a homestead is where I see somebody has, oh, I see, you know, you, oh, I see what he did there. He had a bunch of extra uh, railroad ties, and then instead of you know pitching them out, I could see where he used those to build, you know, whatever. And and that is that is what we have done, and we've actually put together a lot of infrastructure with repurposed materials. I do that first if I can, first if I can. But then if I have to buy stuff. Uh, I've gone to buying from other homesteads, like homestead provisions. I buy lumber from them. And um, 
and then my last place is going to be would be well i don't know if it's going to be home depot anymore i'm not sure i'm going to do that because that is the that is the component of of the well let's borrow a bunch of money and we'll build this you know then that's when you start using those guys and a lack of personality involved there i can feel what i'm trying to communicate i can feel it uh all right so i've i've actually seen this happen i knew a, a guy i haven't seen him in years and years but he was uh he made lots and lots of money in uh in another business and then sold that business and then tried to recreate tried to build a homestead that had personality and it, you could see the attempt where he would get a good idea and then call a contractor and say, I want that built right there. And then later on, it'd be like, well, that's in the way. That's not, that's not what I want there. So then that building would become abandoned or just piled junk in it. And, uh, you know, things like that. There was a lot of fence lines that didn't match up and I don't know, place just didn't flow. When you'd walk around it, you'd say like, this place looks like it was thrown together in six months and it was because the fellow had all the money that he needed and then he you know just make stuff happen and then not there wasn't the uh there wasn't the blessing of time to go in there to where you get to say ah, it's a good thing i didn't do that i was going to do that but i'm glad i didn't and here's a, an example i told i'd give you an example i got inspired one day and I even made a video to commemorate it. I was going to get a tattoo. Good thing I didn't. But I got inspired. Uh, I was under the hay mow in our barn. And I got to looking at it. And I thought, this would be a great place to have a dining room under the hay mow. And, uh, you know, this is not too long ago. I wasn't a young, I wasn't a child having that idea. And I could see it. And I thought this would be great for our classes that we do. You know, it'd be great. Uh, I can see dining room tables out there and then a kitchen over here on this side. Oh, this is going to be awesome. But in a lot of ways, I was looking at it as about a 15-year-old, you know, thinking that I could build a tunnel under my parents' house. You know, yeah, I can do this. I know I can do this. Until you find out that there's concrete on the other side. Of that. That's, well, I guess I can't do this. And uh, I went further than that. We broke out a lot of the concrete under there and started moving things along, you know, put a lot of work into it. Parker came and helped, and we jackhammered all the, the concrete out and got a lot of it moved out. Um. And then as I looked at it, as I was doing it, I started thinking, wait a minute, I don't know, I don't know. And it was one of those things where I went to my partners on this, my family, and I said, you know what, we need to, we need to do this because this will cash flow us. Like this will help us in our, the classes that we do. In reality, no, it won't because what we use now is the dining room of the house when we have classes here. House works fine. I don't like to do that to the girls because it, it messes everything up to have all these people have to come in the house and then the, the kitchen gets used and you know gets messed up pretty good. And we got to get right back to the class so they get left with a huge mess. And I don't like doing that. But that's what we've had to do. And uh, we tried to borrow money to make that project happen. And for one reason or another, the bank said, no, we really don't like to invest in stuff like that. And I said, are you kidding me? We don't have enough equity in this place to borrow $30,000? And they're like, no. And so, well, fine. <laughs> There's plenty of banks in this town. And that was enough to make us think, maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe that's not a good idea. And everybody kind of came to the same conclusion and we didn't do it. 
So what did we do, right? What did we do? Okay, that sparked another thought process. And we had a perfectly good uh, building uh, on the back of the barn. It was the, a lean-to on the back of the barn. Perfectly good, good size, nice and open. And uh, we decided that we would convert that from the maintenance shop into the new butcher shop because we needed way more room in the butcher shop. There's just too many people in, in class time. And um, so that was a better idea. And then the old butcher shop would become a dining room, right? Because we have to feed people during these classes. And then the old butcher shop being a dining room would be a really nice place because it's going to have to have a kitchen in the front part of the butcher shop. So the old butcher shops. So that will be a kitchen slash like grill place so that like on tribe day, people can go in there and they can get a burger. They can go in there and they could get a, you know, a bottle of water or maybe even pop or stuff like that, you know, it'll be for sale in there. And it's nice and central. And then just south of there, I've got a really nice plan right here for a petting zoo, a little petting zoo area, which I think is a mainstay. I mean, you, you're going to do on your farm and people come with children. Um, kids aren't impressed with hay fields. They're not impressed with, um, you know, a milk house. They don't care about that. Their kids aren't impressed with a, uh, you know, a, a presentation about soils management. They don't care about that stuff. But you set a kid down and put a rabbit in its lap. Oh, they're impressed with that. Or some chickens that they can play, some little chicks, or some puppies, or little lambs, or little kid goats, stuff like that. Oh, kids are impressed with that. And they will stay there for literally, literally hours and hours and hours. And we want to make it so that um, a person can push a stroller in there because a lot of time we have moms coming with little kids, with really little kids, and they need a cool place to sit and someplace their other kids can play and they can keep an eye on them, you know. So you're going to put benches in there so mom can sit in there and take care of her infant and, uh, you know, the kids can play with the other animals. And there'll be some things, you know, little kid things. So... The, the new plan so much better than the old plan. And had they loaned us the money to do that, we probably it, we would have it built. And what we've decided to do with that space that's under the barn, that when that barn was built, it was designed for a milk, uh, a milking area, right? They would milk like six cows in, in the six or ten, but they would probably allow four in at a time. Maybe they let all ten in at a time. I don't really know. Um, but then the add-on to that was the milk house where you would handle all the milking equipment and jug up the milk or whatever they did then. They put it in big cans and they had a cooling vat. <clears throat> and we're going to rebuild that because we milk cows. I mean, what a concept. You already have a milking facility that's kind of run down. Let's upgrade it. And, and milk cows in there. It, it only makes sense. It only makes sense. So if the bank had engaged and they'd say, here you go, here's 30, 30 grand, we would have a dining room under the hay mow. And now when I think about a dining room under the hay mow, I don't get the warm fuzzies by that. Not at all. You know why? Because you'd be... It'd be like in a tunnel. There was no windows. You'd be looking out the side and you'd be looking at, you know, tractors and stuff parked in the barn. It wouldn't have been a good idea. It just really wasn't. I had a great idea or what I thought to be a great idea, but it wasn't as good as the one that came with a little bit of time to think about it. So don't always think about building your homestead like, we got to get this done. We got to get this done. No. Take it slow. Take it thoughtfully. Uh, I've moved lots of fence lines here because I build them and I think, okay, it's perfect spot. And then later on, I'd be like, oh no, why did 
they do that. That that's not the way we want this place to flow. We want because this there's definitely things that you have to consider when you're doing this, right? And uh, <clears throat> you know the, the habits of the animals, the separation of animals. Do you want uh, do you want your grazing cattle to have access to your chicken tractors? No, you don't, because in the chicken tractors, there are troughs in there with chicken feed, and that's like cocaine to uh, grazing animals. They they will blow through those chicken tractors to get at that that chicken feed, and so you don't want them anywhere near those. So you have to configure things so that that's <clears throat> the way it's going to work. It's not a free for all. All right, you don't fence the place in and let the animals run. They won't work. And as as you as you uh, go through this, as you live on it, and you're sitting recreating, let's say, like our we've got a place where we have campfires and stuff. And as I'm sitting there, a lot of times, if I'm by myself or sitting with somebody that's not talking to me, I will think about things. And one of the things that I think about a lot is the time that our cows got into the market garden and somebody had put a lot of work into the market garden and then the cows got in there and they you know like he had several rows of uh plants that were up about this high and i think they were like uh what were they like uh cabbage and she just walked down the row and just chomp 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 so took them all off and like oh no but imagine if it had been further season and the heads had formed she would have taken those too you know so then we had to say oh we've got to have a barrier of separation so the cows can't get in there they shouldn't have been in there but uh something went wrong and things happen you know things some things go. I heard the cows were out this weekend while we were gone. <clears throat> and I'm asking, hey, how'd the cows get out? We don't know. Well, where'd you put them back in? You put them back in at that gate at the top of the driveway. Was the gate open? No. Well, then where did they get out? Well, we don't know. Okay. I went around, I checked both gates that they could get out and the both gates were closed. So it's not going to happen again, but you know, things, things do happen. It's kind of an inter interesting story. When I came in the house yesterday, there was a little, uh, a low box in front of the, <clears throat> the wood stove with a towel in it. And it almost looked that had a little animal in there, you know, to warm it up. And they said, what's this? And Jim says, oh, Frank had a chickadee fly into the milk bucket. And he took it out and brought it in here to dry it off. And I'm thinking the milk bucket, the milk bucket that we use to milk the cows that you, you know, has the pulsator on top and the milk flows into. And I'm thinking... How would a chickadee fly in there? And Jim's like, I don't know, but he, he said it happened. And uh, then I'm looking, I, I'm kind of looking around and something catches my eye and I look up on the rafter and there's a chickadee up there on the rafter. And he looks like he's been, you know, he looks like he was wet and, uh, and dried off. You know, he just had that look about him. <clears throat> and so I said, huh, the story has taken shape here. And then Frank comes in and I said, Frank, how did the chickadee get in the milk bucket? And he said, I don't know. He just, he was flopping around in the milk bucket when I went out there. I said, did you have the top off of it? And he's like, oh no, not that milk bucket. It was the milk bucket that's out. The cheese, right? And so the whey or whatever, the skim milk uh, was put out on the back porch and the dogs will lap out of it, you know? So, so this chickadee was in there. So Frank scooped it out of there and saved its life. And so, oh, okay. Now I get the picture what happened. And so then Frank climbs up on the rafter and grabs his chickadee 
and he takes it outside and he's going to let it go and he puts it down on the picnic table and, and some cat <laughs> dives over his shoulder and grabs chickadee and away it goes. The poor thing. Didn't make it. Didn't make it. But you know you're in a uh, farm family, a well-established farm family when people laugh about it, you know. I thought it was tragic. Poor chickadee. Okay, there's another aspect of this that I do want to go over as well. I touched on a little bit. I talked about repurposing stuff. Um, I believe that one of the things that has helped me along the way to a, a fairly successful homestead, and I'm a long way in my mind. I, I have a, so many things that I want to do. Um, that it just right now it's, it's two things. It's time and money. I either have no time or no money and it's very real. And sometimes I have no time or money. We're just run out of both. Um, one of the things that's helped us along the way is to be flexible with the use of materials. So the industry says, oh no, for walls, you use this. And then I'm the one that will say, well, what if this work? Would this be a suitable substitute? Or in this service, we say a suitable sub, suitable sub. <clears throat> will it do the same thing? Of course, in the Air Force, if you wanted to use a suitable sub, you had to get clearance from engineering, you know, well, well, you know, we were going <laughs> to, I don't know. Um, and there's not very often where you can actually use suitable subs in the business that I was in, but sometimes, sometimes you can. Um, but in this business, oh yeah, you certainly can. So a lot of our building that we do, it's not exactly what the, uh, the consultants at Home Depot would say, this is how you do this, you know, or tool time with Tim is how he does it. Sometimes we do things a little bit differently. I would exactly say, you know, rigged. I would say that. I would say we, we're practicing form, no, function over form, right? So I want things to look good. I want it to, if something's built, I want it to appear that Whoever did that cared what they were doing. I, I'm big about that. I'm big on that. Uh, but I also feel like if it works, it works, you know. And then we're moving to the next thing. It's like we're we're building this so it will work, so we can get this function done, and then we go to the next thing, right? So we're able to kind of turn a blind eye to a wall that's made out of OSB and – you know, maybe that's not what you should be using in a dining room, but you know, what the heck it's, it's more important that it functions than the way that it looks like it's not proper. That is not proper, right? We're not big into that. We're not, that's just us. You know, I, I, I know, uh, the, the fellow that I was talking about before that was rich that put together homestead, he put in fences and when he went and picked them out, some salesman convinced him to put in these three rail uh, vinyl fences, right? So they were literally PVC slats, and there was three of them. And I mean, it, they were shiny and they looked dopey, but he paid top dollar for them, you know? And it was like a fencing contractor came in and just come up. And you looked at it, you're like, that looks terrible. <laughs> it just looks really raw. But there was a lot of stuff like that on his place because he just needs to be a fence. The contractor puts in fences, put in a fence. And so they did. And it just it it just didn't look right, you know. It didn't look it didn't look like a guy put it together who said that stepped back from it and said, Okay, that looks good. That looks all right. It just was like, need a fence there. So some guy says, well, this is a fence, so put it. And then is able to just jump in a service truck and leave. That's the way it looked to me. 
Um, we also uh, have owe, owe a lot of credit to my father who got me going on scrounging. You know, I was of the mindset that, well, we should just buy all new materials all the time. And my father was like, no, we're not going to do that. You know, he was a scrounger big time, grew up in <clears throat> Lawrence, Massachusetts. And if you know where that is, it's a very, very poor area, just a textiles place. I have no idea what's going on there. No, but uh, he, he grew up very poor and they had to do, they had to make do. And uh, I learned a lot from him about scrounging materials, things like that. Like we have on our farm, we have the gile, and it has everything out there from old fencing to old cars and everything in between because, yeah, I have this pile of wire and I don't have an immediate use for it right now, but I may. And then if I am looking for something and I think, man, I I think maybe I got some wire around here someplace. I go out to the junk pile. And, yep, sure enough, there it is. I knew I was going to need that sooner or later. So it's sort of like my my store of material <clears throat> and where I I like the place to look uptight. I don't store it close to the, the house and the barns and stuff. I store it. I got a place, the junk pile, right? And you can see that if you come here. Um, the cows graze out there. They graze in between stuff. So it's, I got to be a little careful. I can't have stuff out there that they could accidentally ingest or step on and hurt themselves, things like that. But I do need to keep the, the grass down around it. All right, let's see what we got here for comments. Debbie Van Fossen's with us. Debbie's been shooting me a lot of good intel lately. What do you think, Deb? What's going to happen? I don't know. I don't know. You notice our Debbie Van Fossen. Have, have you noticed our <clears throat> Joe? Uh, the videos, the shorts, and the videos have really been taken off. I, I think it's I, this morning. I was looking at it like, oh, we finally cut a break. But I was wondering, are things changing in the the war between the factions? You know, which I don't want to be on either team, but. Uh, I just wonder if that's what's going on. Mystic Meadow, thanks for the shout out. No, that wasn't me. LOL. It was just a little homestead in Georgia. Okay. Do you have a um a YouTube channel? That sounds familiar. Okay, and here's Brian. Brian's saying, I started mine in a two-bedroom apartment. So it is a mindset, isn't it? I think it is. I think it is. And I think that some of the some of the most essential things that you want to gather up at first for your homestead is information. You know, books, videos, how-tos, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. And then well, I can't get this done in the two-bedroom apartment anymore. We're going to have to get something a little bigger. Maybe it's a house that's got a quarter-acre lot. Is that enough? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is it the end? Could be, but, but maybe not. You know, maybe you're going to want to graduate from there after you get it fixed up. And, you know, a quarter, like we're going to do this quarter-acre homestead uh, project this summer. Um, you'll be able to see, I want, I definitely want before and after photos. Definitely, because right now there's engine blocks sitting there, you know, and car hoods and things like that. And so I want pictures of those to begin. And then um, as we progress through it and then we get a flow going there and we get a chicken house in and we get a, some raised beds and, you know, all the things that we think we can possibly stuff into this place. But I want it to look good. And then we will use it as an Airbnb as well. So you can come and stay on the quarter acre homestead. Uh, I believe it'll be quite inspirational. There's a lot of noise going on out there in that room. A 
lot of noise. Can you guys hear that? Those are my grandkids out there tearing it up. All right. All right. Bear Up Farm. Good good evening, everyone. Good evening to you. Right on. And, and Debbie's saying yes. Yeah. I think the uh the war is is raging. You know, when a lot of you have been with us on this channel, it's been kind of like a, a journey, you know. I got into this doing this uh Oh, this podcast. And at the time I would, I mean, this is years ago. I'd say, well, I don't know. I'm optimistic. I think things are going to turn in our country. I think things are going to work out. And, uh, the Trump was the president and, uh, you know, the libs were freaking out. And, and, uh, but I, I said, I don't know. I'm just optimistic. I feel optimistic. I think things are going to work out with, and then the election happened and the woo flu happened and, uh, all of that. Hold on a sec. I got to quiet down this group out here. <clears throat> so anyway, I kept saying, hey, I'm, I'm optimistic. And, and I don't know. I think we were thinking that there's going to be some like one side's going to win, all the Republicans will take over, and then everything will be all right. As time went by, it seemed stupider and stupider and stupider because they're no better than the other ones. The other ones really are kind of off, but the Republicans had control, and they don't ever do anything. It's like they never do anything. And so uh, I started to believe that you know the, the change for me or my quality of life is right here. It's right here. So I've got to build my life here for my family and my kids. Hopefully it holds. Hopefully there's not a you know, you know, World War II style war and there's you know bombs dropping out of this. Hope, but that's way out of my control. Um, but the quality of life that I enjoy here is directly related to what I'm talking about, building this homestead. Um, and creating an environment to live in. And as things have evolved, I've been more and more feeling as though, you know, no one's coming. Like the, the cavalry's over the hill. It's not like the, you know, all of a sudden there's going to be a takeover of the good guys. And then the bad guys, what? You're going to put them on an island and push them out into the Atlantic? Who are the bad guys anyway? I don't know. So that whole scenario that they spun uh, took up a lot of our time and a lot of our thought process. And we should have been thinking about, hey, uh, why are we not uh, building incubators and incubating our own eggs and and things like that? And uh, why are we not figuring out new and improved ways, which Joe and I are doing today, uh, we're, we're figuring out new and improved ways to bring this information to people who want it in a usable package that's fun and and informative and you know um solution orientated right instead of all the all the negative stuff like you know i i don't want i've listened to i have listened to prepper channels before <clears throat> and it's not like they're going to be disappointed if there isn't world war three they're like, well, if there's nuclear holocaust, at least I can go down in my hole and sit down there and eat MREs, and then life will be good. Are you kidding? You know, that's kind of the mindset. And uh, man, I don't, I don't want to do that. We have to just break away from that individually and create our own lives. And the only way that I know to do that is the homestead. That's, I mean, maybe it's because I'm holding a hammer; everything looks like a nail, but. That's what it seems like to me, because uh, I don't really know what else I would do besides maybe getting that shrimping boat and heading down to the Gulf Coast. But no, this is it. This is what I'm I'm going to stay with. Um, let's see. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Okay, so a little bit more input on the uh, building the farm and the homestead without the bank. Uh, 
in the United States right now, we have this mantra that's being foisted on the people. You get it from the news and then all of us smart ones, right, Deb? Find alternative stuff on the internet that says diametrically opposed to what Rachel Maddow was saying. So we figure, well, it must be right, right? But it's still, it's still part of the, the narrative, the narrative of doom and gloom, destruction, and, you know, take the, take the, you know, you know what, don't take the, you know, what, you know, wear the, you know, what, don't wear the, you know, what, all that stuff. It's all, and it's just creating, uh, like a hamster wheel effect. People are just on the wheel listening to it. Oh, any day now, any day now, there's going to be a breakthrough, right? Instead of creating their own breakthroughs, right? Because of that, because of that, that hamster wheel effect, at least this is my theory. Um, resources are being left strewn about. And, <clears throat> the only time that I remember ever seeing like anything like this is when people are, and you know, I, I don't know as I saw it directly, um, maybe indirectly I saw it when people are intently focused on one thing. And let's say it is a, a war scenario. And I, I am not a war person. I am, I'm dead. Dead set against it. It's a stupid thing trying to. The guy's got the wrong jersey on, so you try to shoot him with a rifle. That's dumb. It's really dumb. There's no reason to be doing this. We're better than that. But yeah, we do do it. And then it it starts out with sticks, and then rocks, and then BB guns, and then rifles, and then artillery, and then airplanes with bombs on it. You know, it gets out of hand real fast. And then there's companies that benefit from it. That's not the point, but. Um, what happens when people get intently focused on trying to just kill the other guy is they wind up leaving stuff all over the place, good stuff, you know, because they're intently focused on doing that. And the other guy's intently focused on killing you too. So, you know, should you, uh, you worry about that poncho that you were sleeping under when you got to get out of there? No, you just leave it. So, hey, look at this. Good poncho laying here on the ground. Hey, awesome. I got me a poncho. <clears throat> well, that's what's going on now. Because you have kind of both sides, it seems to me, that are intently focused on what's going to happen next. We got balloons flying over. We got tr tractor supply feed that's killing our chickens, probably mutating them. You probably shouldn't eat those eggs because I know – they put the flu in the in the chicken supply, and you're going to get it through the egg. You know, there's it's it never ends nowadays. You know, and you can access crazy stuff after crazy stuff. After, don't get me wrong, Deb. Don't don't cut me off now. But um, I'm looking at it differently than I I was before, um, because I think that 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 information warfare that happens. It puts you in a state of just stuck, you know? Oh, maybe Alex Jones is right. Oh, maybe Red Maddow's right. Well, maybe it's a combination of the two, you know? Maybe they're actually married. Rachel and Alex Jones are actually secret lovers behind the scenes. You know, it's of no use. Either, either. One is no use. Like Alex Jones doesn't tell you something that, oh, I better listen to what he says and uh, invest wisely. It doesn't really happen. It it, it doesn't really happen. He, there's never information like that. It's always just caution, fear, caution, fear. Those guys, look what they're doing. Caution, fear. And those guys are over there saying, oh, homophobes, you know, nah, 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 nah. constantly. And, uh, and then you pick a team because, well, I guess I am a homophobe. So you pick this team and then you kind of go with what they, I don't think that's a good idea. And I'm trying to get away from that. I really am trying to get away from that and focus on the basics, 
the stuff that I can put my hands on, incubator, chicken eggs in the incubator. 30 days later, chicks come out. Now my grandkids are playing with chicks in the other room. 12 nice chicks that, heck, if we bought them from Tractor Supply now, six bucks a piece for them. And we just hatched them out of this these eggs. Is this reality? Yeah, it's reality. It's reality. And whether or not the Chinese balloon is, you know, even speculating on it, it's just, to me, anymore, it's just a stupid joke. A friend of mine, I think he may listen to this show too, that I've known for going on, oh, wow. It's going on a long time. It's going on over 30 years. Uh, we were stationed together at Loring Air Force Base. And I started hearing information about the New World Order way back then, way back then. And, you know, the the coming persecution of Christians. And let's see, what else? Um, well, things like that. Oh, the the deep state, you know, the shadow government. And I remember hearing it, and then uh, there was actually a pastor of a church that gave me a tape. Of, it was called The New World Order, is, and, and it went from there. It was a cassette tape, and uh, I was trying to tell this friend of mine about this stuff. And he was, you know, he was doing other stuff. He's fishing, he's deer hunting, he's moose hunting, he's, he's doing all kinds of stuff. He's, I don't want to hear about that. And I remember at the time thinking, you need to hear about this. This is so pertinent, so important. And uh, it wound up, what, 30 years later? We're still talking about the New World Order. He sent me a video this morning of a, a CIA agent who had entered himself into the whistleblower protection program. And now he's briefing people publicly about how bad the CIA is about you know the, the shadow government and all this stuff and all these mechanisms they have for small private armies and hit squads and all this stuff right well why how are you operating out in the open and this is from a long time ago this is from i think the obama administration and at this thought well that's ironic you know we've been waiting for you know the end of this for a long time when when i walk out the, the door on my homestead, I can make a difference like right now. I can do something that will have an effect right now. Does it change the status of, you know, some CIA operative? No, they don't care. And that's kind of the point. They don't care about us. They, they're they playing spy, counter spy with other spies. We're just like the, the, the peasants. And I'm glad, you know, I mean, uh, there was a time when I would think it would probably be pretty cool. Like, hey, maybe I'll get out of the Air Force. I'll go in the CIA because then I can say to people, well, I'm not supposed to say anything, but I'm in the CIA, right? That'll be cool. Get to carry a gun and everything. The hell with that. The hell with that. Honestly, no, this is a good lifestyle. Eat good food, sleep in a warm house, get to... uh act on my my uh creativity you know if you work for an outfit like the air force that i work hey i have a really good idea i got a really good idea they have a form for, for that good idea it's called a form 1000 yeah fill it out and submit it for for further disapproval they don't want to hear your good ideas you're uh you're a, a fuel pumper you're a bomb loader you know they don't want to hear what you have to say and I, I get that because you're not an engineer. You don't build airplanes. You don't build those systems. So shut up, right? And I know people do put in Form 1000s and get, you know, out of boys out of it and stuff. Put one in one time. I thought B-52s, I thought we should do away with the uh, the guns on the back of the airplane. We had a, a gun that fired in the, in, the, in the tail of the airplane, the tail gunner. And I thought, why don't we get rid of that? And we'll put uh, wing-mounted sidewinders on the B-52s. And then you could have one of the uh, 
launch control ops or not launch control, but the bombardiers could man a scope and could, you know, let sidewinders go in reverse off the airplane, you know, and hit the same targets that the gunner would hit. Uh, it was disapproved. They'd see it my way. Wait, we're at 9.05. Um, let's see. Have I covered everything that you guys want to know about? Um, Agreed Dog, is that your is that your website? Should I be looking that up? Mystic Meadow. That's a nice name. Okay. White Dog. Oh, I see what happened. White Dog Farm said, focus on the task at hand. Everything else is obsolete. All the BS had me wrapped up for a while. I had to step back. There you go. That's that's kind of what I'm saying. Um now it's more like it's more like entertainment, um, and I, I, I apologize if you've heard this this explanation before. But when I was overseas, uh, you know, you're kind of cut off from the world, and uh, at the time, the show uh, Dallas was on, and people would get videotapes sent from home, you know, and to show Dallas. And, uh, you know, guys at the shop were actually discussing who really shot J.R. You know, if you remember that, that show is J.R. Ewing. And uh, I remember hearing these guys talking about this like it's real. Like, oh, no, she would never do that. She wouldn't do that. And she loves him, you know. And I thought, you guys, you know, it's determined by the script writers. It's not real. It's made up. Well, yeah, but it, in a way it is because they wouldn't put in anything there that wouldn't happen, you know. And we're just discussing what would really happen if. And uh, a lot of the, you know, the spy counter spy thing of 2020 from 2020 to 2023 is kind of like, like that, you know. Even when people are commenting on, say, the president, well, I think he's got Alzheimer's. I think it's terrible that wife puts him out there. You know, an old man like that. I think it's just terrible. And then other people say, well, you know, it's just part of the script. It's not even a real guy. I mean, that's a that's like an actor. That's not really Joe Biden. Actually, Joe Biden is down in Guantanamo Bay. Or I think he was executed over in Africa a couple of years ago. You know, all these stories. And you pick the one that you think sounds better. You know, that's it. Or the one that fits into what you think the way it ought to be. You pick that one and I'm going to go with that one. Yeah. Jill Biden was actually a Playboy bunny at one time. Hugh Hefner had her first, right? I like that one. <clears throat> but in reality, it's all just not reality i think when we go out and we collect our eggs hey that's reality when we decide hey, we're going to build a petting zoo here and children are actually going to go into that petting zoo and experience the magic of this life that we've been given instead we could all sit out there and we could talk about you know uh you know the next thing the next conspiracy theory or whatever you know and i honestly i've I've heard them all. And, you know, I was part of the, uh, the, the military complex. So a lot of the stuff I thought that I was, I was knowing the truth and nobody else did. And I had to wake people up. I remember, uh, well, I remember when the whole Waco thing happened, uh, and, uh, you know, we got, pretty good evidence that uh those people were in fact murdered and but we that was one side of the story and i mean there was photographic evidence of a certain type of tank that was used that actually had the capacity to throw flame had a flamethrower on it um, i believe it was an m67 and they had to take it out of mothballs to use it and anyway i don't know but that goes way back, way, way back. And then, you know, 9-11, everything. 
where what what is really going on seems to be a struggle between factions <clears throat> but not us like if one faction wins and finally winner takes all will we reap the benefits of it i don't think so if the other side wins are they gonna what put us all on wraps and put us out in the atlantic i don't think so we're the we're the worker bees out here um i don't know I don't know, but I do know that if we go to work on our homesteads and we become uh, active on our innovative capacity as human beings, that we can build great things and we'll pay less attention to that, you know, to who shot Jay, pay less attention to it and uh, focus on the reality that is our homestead. Well, there you go. That's what I have uh, for tonight. I'm <clears throat> just back today after being gone for a while, and I got a couple days to get things together, and then I'm pulling out again on Monday. And boy, do we have a lot of things to accomplish. We are having a planning meeting on Tribe Day. Uh, that's going to happen when we get back from my son's graduation. And that's that's right around the corner, really. It's July. It, it comes a lot faster than we'd like to think. We have lots of things ready for that. Um, and then we've got our regular farm stuff that we have to do. We've got chickens coming next month. Our first load of chicks are coming. And, uh, yeah, we're back in the swing of things. Uh, just got a lot to do, a whole lot to do. I appreciate everybody coming by. Uh, we will not be having a consulting call this coming wednesday this is our week off and then we'll be skipping the next week that's unfortunate but i will be i will be gone um we will be having a uh interview this coming thursday we've got something really special planned this guy that we're going to be interviewing, we go way back with him. Me and Joe went to a, a class that he gave at the Small Farms Conference, oh man, long time ago. And he's a mushroom guy. He's the guy that actually we, we give out the link for his operation, um, Forest and Field, I think it's called. And uh, we've used their products for a a long time so i'm gonna do him all about mushrooms and mushroom production i think it mushroom production is a really neat thing for the homestead we do it tonight i had a beef stew that jill put in a can of mushrooms from our mushroom logs and they make the stew i mean it's just it's just really really good uh, it's not hard to do. It's something if you have a small amount of property, you can you can set up mushroom logs. There's several different ways to do it, and it's a good way to, you know, they're good for you too, and they're fun to eat. So we're going to be talking with him. Um, yeah, quarter acre homestead project. We are going to start on that maybe this week even. I'm going to be doing what i can i've got three days uh before the weekend so i'm going to be doing what i and i have one more filming day with joe um you guys if you haven't seen joe's shorts <laughs> joe's shorts you're going to want to go to the anyone can farm experience youtube and you can see them there and they're really dynamite they're just like a minute long so he's got to get a message across in a minute he tells me what he wants me to say, and I say it, and I spice it up a little bit, and then he puts it out there, and they're really doing well. So uh, homesteading and social living, you know, it's it, it, there's like a sucking sound. People want it. They want it, and uh, Joe's providing it for them. Also, we are working on a homestead milk cow series. We shot that a lot of that today. Um, I think it's going to be really fun and informative too. I mean, really helpful if you th think that you want to have a milk cow on your farm. I highly recommend it. 
it's been one of the most rewarding experiences that we've done on the homestead. It's really good. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see what else. Uh, we got one, one more day of filming this week for other things. Uh, we got a lot on the horizon. I want to direct you now to the anyone can farm experience.com. Go to that website, please, and check it out. Do all the like and share and all that stuff. Share it with your friends. But do me a solid and sign up for the Anyone Can Farm Tribe Plus. Tribe Plus. That's a, that is what's called a paywall. So there's stuff on the other side of that paywall. So all of this stuff, you get that stuff for nothing, right? And the idea is to inspire, to equip, <clears throat> and, uh, and and get you going on this homesteading thing, which is what we need as a country. Um, but we have to keep the lights on. So by signing up with the, uh, the Tribe Plus, that paywall is what we pay people with. You know, we, Joe's got to be paid. Supposedly I'm supposed to be paid, I guess I get, I get fed pretty good. Um, but that's the idea. And then those dollars, we can, we can fold those dollars back into the operation, you know, to make it better and cleaner and fortify the position we have. So that's the idea. If you want to contribute to us, uh, there's a, a way to do it. It's probably the best way to do it. You know, if you do a, want to do a one-time thing, I guess you can go in here and still do do super chats. I haven't seen one of those things in a long time, but you can. But I think I would rather have people signing up for the Tribe Plus and boost those numbers. Um, we are constantly uh, plotting new material that we can put behind that paywall. And um, the like the um, the Homestead Cow series will be there. Um, there's already a bunch of stuff behind there. We now that we're getting a footprint, uh, we have people that come to us and say, "Hey, would you like to uh, put in a plug for for this type of boot?" That and Joe says to him, "Well, maybe you know if they're good boots." And they said, "Well, we'll." send you a couple pairs okay so frank's getting a pair and i'm getting a pair and i'm gonna try them out and if they're good yeah yeah i'll pass it on be like half as much as we pay for the boots that we buy now right and they look pretty good so if they're as good as the boots we get now i'll pass it on for sure like i'm not above endorsing a product that's good i do that anyway you know i and if your businesses you are a business that is around us that we do business with, and you would like to get an endorsement from us, we can do that. I mean, that's the idea of this network, right? But there's a price. There's a price. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess I'm going to call it good for tonight. Boy, that sure went by fast. Um, had a great weekend. Uh, thought a lot about the tribe. Thought a lot about how the things that I went through this weekend, how it applies to what we're doing in homesteading. and networking the people together around food and intentional living. Good stuff. Good stuff. I'm glad I'm where I'm at. Okay. Is there anything else? Let's see. Cindy and Yogi, Cindy and Yogi, Cindy and Yogi. I was told the hands and I, the head, they don't want ideas that are against these. I was told you're the hands and I'm the head. They don't want ideas that go against theirs. Well, I'm not exactly sure what you mean there. But yeah, that's part of the reason for the separation, uh, keep people separated, you know, Stay healthy. Stay six feet apart from people. Put a face mask over yourself and don't look at anybody in the eye. Certainly don't talk to them about what they want or don't want. No, you don't want that. 
because there's power there, right? And so that was, there was a, you know, maybe their plan was that we would still be standing six feet apart, social distancing. Remember that? It seems like a long time and people don't do it anymore, but um, some people did. I saw people down in Chicago still wearing face masks. Weirdest thing. It's the weirdest thing. There was two girls came in, sat in at a restaurant me and Joel were sitting in. And they came in, they had face masks on, the waitress seated them. And as soon as they sat down, they took their face masks off, folded them up and put them in their Gucci purses. And then before they left, deployed their little masks and went out the door. They were safe in the booth. It was really strange. Really strange. It's sort of like, sort of. Uh, okay, Mystic Meadow. No, I don't have a channel. Thinking about it, though. Just don't know if I want my life on display, but I commend everybody who does. Yeah, I can see that. There'll be a time when we won't we won't, won't do this, I'm sure. There'll be enough animation out there. Me and Joel will be on the shrimp boat down in the Gulf Coast. All righty. If there's nothing else, I think I'm going to call it a day. Long drive yesterday. I wound up taking a nap this afternoon. It was way too long, so I know I'm going to have a late night tonight all right if there's nothing else i think i'm going to get going i appreciate everybody come by uh do us a favor give us a like and a share give us a thumbs up and all that good stuff it all helps um and uh i guess that's why things have broken loose lately all right i'll see you remember anyone can farm good night